The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, may be seated. But who do you say that I am? This was a question I was asked at my approval for being a pastor. Well, not exactly that question, but very similar. My professor, Sam Geary, asked, if you were asked to describe who Jesus is to someone who had never heard of Jesus, what would you say? Who do you say that Jesus is? Think about that. Really, who do you say that Jesus is? How would you describe Jesus to someone? What words would you say? My answer centered around the radical grace of God, the complete love that Jesus has for all of us, that there is no one that can love us as much as Jesus. Even in those times when you feel completely alone, even in those times when your family and your friends have walked away, Jesus stands by your side saying nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate you from the love I have for you. I forgive you when no one else can. Pure love, radical grace. This is who I say Jesus is. Since we have been focused on the word grace and radical grace, in the news, I've been trying to hear for and listen for God's radical grace in the world and in our communities and on the news. On Tuesday, I heard an interview on a podcast of the Daily Post. I was moved by this interview Michael Barbero did with Derek Black. Here's where I heard an example of love and grace this week. Derek Black was part of a white nationalist movement. He was born and raised into one of the most prominent white nationalist families in the country. His father was a former Grand Master of the Ku Klux Klan, and his godfather is David Duke. During the interview, Derek talks about how he left the white nationalist movement that he was raised to be a leader in. The first time that Derek moved away from his home, he went to a small liberal college three and a half hours from his home in Florida. No one knew who he was, and he did not volunteer anything about his beliefs. He lived a dual life. He talked about hanging around people who were strong social justice advocates, and he talked about being on his dad, white nationalist radio show, telling the news. He said trying to live two lives was terrifying, 
because he knew someday someone would figure this out. One day someone will Google his name and find out who he really is. There was a time that Derek describes that he was in the cafeteria and one of the students came up to his friends and had a laptop in his hand and said, have you seen this website, The Storm Front? It's a white nationalist website. And he said, can you believe that people, these people, someone is trying to get the Lord of the Rings into white nationalism? That's insane. Ironically, Derek founded that link, Lord of the Rings, and connected it to white nationalism. But he sat there and he played like he didn't know about this site, he didn't know anything about it, and he said, what is Stormfront? And he looked at the site that he actually knew well. The interview goes on and Derek tells about how he was found out. The student body exploded and Derek is shunned on the campus. No one will look at him, talk to him, or give him any time of day. Now here's where the radical grace comes in. In Derek's time of isolation, he gets an invita invitation to go to a meal. It was a friend that he had gotten to know in the first semester before people knew who he was. The friend was an observant Jew who had Shabbat dinners often on campus on Fridays when he was in town. He would invite different people, people who were atheists and all sorts of different religions for dinner together. So Derek's Jewish friend sent him an invitation to join them for dinner. He invited Derek even after he learned about his white nationalism. He invited Derek after reading what was on the Stormfront website. His friend, his Jewish friend doubted that he would convince Derek of anything. He just wanted to let Derek see a Jewish community so that if Derek was going to keep saying these anti-Semitic things, that he at least would see real Jews and have a conversation with we real Jews. This is radical grace. When everyone else shunned and walked away from Derek, his Jewish friend invited him to dinner, a Shabbat dinner, no less. Derek continued to be invited to the dinners. He would talk with others about many different topics. But eventually, and in time, there grew a trust among the friends. And Derek talked about his beliefs. And so did the other friends talk about their beliefs. Through these conversations, Derek was changed and left the white nationalist movement. Through a radical act of kindness of an invitation to dinner, Derek was transformed. This is radical grace. What I appreciated the most of this story is that Derek's friend reached out to Der Derek when he had all the reason not to. Derek was saying horrible things on this website. The whole community, the whole college community, was against Derek. But Derek's Jewish friend still invited him to dinner. But I also appreciated that Derek's friend took time to be in, become informed about Derek, to hear his point of view, to study, to learn, and to invite Derek into understanding his Jewish background and learn and come together in commonality. Yes, change happened, but that was really secondary. 
I can't help but think we need more chances and opportunities to get to know people who are different than we are. Whether that be how we were born and raised, religious backgrounds, color of skin, sexual orientation, I think in order for us to move forward in God's grace in our world, we need to listen and learn about people we don't tend to hang out with or be with. Jesus was the one who sat and ate with those who no one else would sit with. Jesus was the one who talked and touched people that others would not. But what does that look like today? How do we follow what Jesus taught us to do? I actually think it starts here in our church, right here in worship. Yes, we are people of routine, but I think it starts with us sitting next to people we don't normally sit next to. It starts with us trying a different section of the church. Then it is going into Luther Hall during coffee hour and finding someone we've never talked to before. Also, when you're leaving this place, taking time to say hello to your neighbors or people that you pass. When riding the train, sitting next to someone you have avoided before. Asking directions from someone that doesn't look like you. Being intentional uh, about starting conversations with people who look different than you, who are different than you. Going to a restaurant where English is the second language. The more we get to know people who are different than us, who have different backgrounds than our own, the more we will see God's radical grace at work. My prayer today is that we grow to appreciate, embrace, and celebrate the uniqueness of the people all around us so that we might more fully understand who Jesus is through the people in the world that God so loves. God's radical grace is happening. May we be open to being part of that. Amen.